Hello and welcome back to the Barefoot Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Thompson, the Barefoot Podiatrist. And today I have with me Jay Desherry. Did I get that right? Got it. Yes. He's a renowned physical therapist, author of Running Rewired, Anatomy for Runners, and founder of my favorite balance type board, the MOBO board, which we're going to talk about later on today. Welcome, Jay. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's an honor. Man, we excited to talk to you. Um, so to kick us off, I'd love to just hear about you. Just for those of you who don't know you or don't, those of us who don't know you or what you're about, can you just give us a little bit of a rundown of how you got into the running world um, and how your physical therapy practice has evolved over the time? Because I know you kind of treat and see things a little bit different to other physical therapists. So I'd love to just hear how you got to where you are. For sure. Um, yeah, it's, I've had a, uh, a different background than a lot of folks, I think. Uh, I went to, I was a athlete most of my life. I was a swimmer uh, growing up and then became a triathlete and then done, you know, road cycling, mountain biking, uh, running, you know, lots of different things, right? So uh, went to PT school and was super passionate about musculoskeletal health and really trying to kind of keep that as a focus of my practice and came out of school and realized that none of the stuff I learned in school actually worked. And so um, I wanted to sort of reinvent the wheel. And I, I, I went to a residency for uh, orthopedics and got a little bit more um, knowledge base there and then practiced for about five years. And then this really interesting kind of combination of things started happen. So uh, I was at University of Virginia and um, in the States and we had a new department chair come in and she had a huge startup fund, which a startup fund lets you purchase really fancy equipment for your lab. And so uh, she's Dr. Casey Kerrigan. She's amazing. Um, and so uh, basically I went to her one day and said, hey, we have all this really cool toys for research and we should keep doing research for sure. But what if we actually use all this for N of one research? And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what if anybody could just come in and get analyzed in a true biomechanical lab um, and get, you know, directional information from that. Right? How do I change my training? How do I change my mechanics? How do I cue form? How do we do things to make athlete performance improved? And she's like, that's an awesome idea. What do you want to look at? And I was like, I have absolutely no idea. So <laughs> I went to the library and read like every article in biomechanics testing. Cause this is, you know, 15 years ago. And like we had toys, right? But there weren't many people who knew what to do with that data. It was still in, like the biomechanics realm where you look at ones and zeros and go, mm -hmm. okay, what do we see? Well, here's some data. What do I do with it? I don't know, I'm an engineer, right? And so we had a bunch of great engineers in the room and I come in as a clinician and we had to learn to talk, right? We had to learn to, you know, to make sense of biomechanical data. They had to learn how to look at things from a patient-centered view or, or a client-centered view in terms of what, what's important for, for analysis. And so like this thing really gelled in the next few years and, and became, I, amazing right i mean uh you know i've not trying to hit too my horn but i've been uh, we were the second uh place in the uh in the whole world to have an instrumented treadmill i've been using these things for longer than pretty much anybody and i think i've actually done more uh individual biomechanical uh gait assessments than anybody else in the world and i'm yeah i'm not trying to hunt my horn but i've seen thousands of individuals and done musculoskeletal evaluations and true gait testing on them as well right so when you do that over and over again, you start to see things come to light, right? And so you start to look at, if you're looking at a test on a table, how does that translate into how they move in, in their sport? And if you look at their sport, how does that translate back to tests on a table, right? So really interesting kind of parameters started kind of showing up and patterns. And it's really changed the way that I approach any type of athletic performance. And I always joke, like, I just work backwards, right? You tell me, hey, I'm an athlete or I'm a patient. And this is my goals. Great. Well, let's just break that down mechanically, right? And then work backwards. Where are you now? What do we have for you to get you there? And the approach has been just, you know, instead of chasing diagnoses and trying to chase symptoms, I try and fix the problem, right? What do I see in terms of the imbalances? People compensate in different ways for different problems, right? But if you identify the problems, it's actually, in my mind, quite easy um, to, to fix things. And so I try to make things very segmented. I came out with a whole kind of treatment approach and courses I teach as well, just how to, you know, how to actually assess someone from a musculoskeletal perspective and how to tease out these problems and then how to fix the problems, right? And then how to cue the problems so that they actually change their form and, you know, change their sport. And so it, it's, I would, I would say that 
I become somewhat quantitative in the way I approach things. And I tell all clinicians and all patients too, you know, if you have a problem, I should be able to measure it and tell you where it is and how severe it is. And we should see an improvement in those metrics as we go through your course of your rehab, right? So um, the goal is to not just change your symptom, but to fix the problems and get you back to the point what you want to, what you want to do. So um, that's kind of the basis for my very odd brain. <laughs> and then, um, you know, off that, right? So I, I, I teach internationally to clinicians and then I, I wrote uh, two books now for um, definitely running centric books, but uh, I've done everything from bite fit courses to major, uh, major companies. I've worked with the army. I've worked with the air force. I've worked with uh, NBA teams and NFL teams, everything else. So it's just um, trying to get a bigger message out there and trying to, you know, help push the needle in terms of what we can do. So it's been fun. It's awesome. I love how you look at fixing the, problem that's something that really changed for me many years ago as well because obviously we're taught to diagnose and then treat that diagnosis in that's what we were taught at um at university and it wasn't until years later that i like similar type of story just somehow stumbled across looking for that deeper problem and it just became easier and sometimes you get so caught up in that diagnosis and you don't look away from it or you you kind of get blinded by that specific little thing rather than looking at the whole picture right it's um, totally it's a game changer and, and it's funny it's like then that leads to the next question people say well i had this diagnosis how do i fix it i'm like i don't know without looking at <laughs> you know it's easy to say this tissue is irritated right maybe you get a spread mm. fracture your tibia you pissed off your posterior tib or whatever like i don't really care I care why that got overloaded to begin with, right? So let's let's te- let's you know take an aim and tease that out. So, mm. um, and that's not try and change people's mindset. It's like tissues get overloaded all the time. That's okay, fine, right? So, how can we you know identify why that began in the first place? And then yeah, how can we get that tissue back to what it, what it should be for your goals? But um, it, it just trying to change that thought process and again like think backwards. I think is has been my my mo so far. Mm. So with like measuring how you want to measure everything to give that um, that reading to the client and to, to measure success, how do you go about measuring patterns? So for me, sometimes I'll find, you know, back to that kind of fixing the whole problem, we'll look at um, you know, the, the, the patterns off, you know, we're trying to change the pattern. And yes, we can kind of measure you know, pain scores or maybe some certain range of motions and things. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to patterns and trying to get things moving together in better sequences and things, like how do you go about measuring that? Do you measure that? Yeah, for sure. So um, give an example here, right? So you look at like patellofemoral pain, so pain in the kneecap region, right, versus IT band pain, right? So um, a lot of research shows that, uh, you know, we, we see problems with what we call triplanar control in the hip and triplanar control in the foot and ankle means basically you have a wobbly leg, right? That leg's wobbling around. And so in the IT band issue, it's creating some shear on the outside of the knee, which can irritate the underlying bursa and cause some pain on the outside of the knee. It can also irritate the, the kneecap because what happens is that wobbly mess is, you know, kind of spiraling in and out. And that kneecap is a pulley trying to track up and down. So same problem, right? Uh, but you'll see sort of different um, compensations in the way people move. For example, we do, yes, we're gain assessments, but we also quantify our screening tools, right? And so for a traditional step-down test, which most clinicians perform in their, in their clinic, right? Just put people on like a six to eight inch block, depending on what research you read. And you have them just perform some single leg squats and you look at the tracking of their knee, right? And we see that in people with IT band pain, right? So we know that as that leg spirals inside a whole lot, it's going to really increase shear on the outside. So what those patients do is they compensate by shifting their knee way to the outside, like way too far, right? Mm. Uh, because it's not got a pain versus the patellofemoral pain patients will allow that to kind of spiral inside and, and, you know, kind of change the mechanics of the joint. So when you start looking for these patterns, you start to say again, like, all right, well, we know we, we want to you know clean up the wobbly mess, right? But then how do you actually discriminate or kind of you know, framework out where you see compensations for this problem, uh, excuse me, uh, you need compensations by diagnosis for specific problems, right? So then you get, you have an even finer lens to look for. So it's just, it's by testing again, like thousands of athletes, right? And, and thousands of patients. And one of the, one of the really cool things we did, so um, this is 
a long time ago, one of our grad students at UVA wanted to do a project to look at the functional movement screen, right, and how it correlated to um, gait. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I said, okay, we'll do that. But I was like, I also want to do some other stuff. And so I actually put together a whole battery of muscle skeletal screen myself and said, oh, let's look how that corresponds to gait. And what we found was that the FMS is a very general way to look at general imbalances in a general population. And that's what it's designed for, right? But if you look at the FMS ability to discriminate and find those patterns you're talking about from like a gait analysis, it's not sensitive or specific enough, right? It's just... Mm-hmm. And again, you're saying, okay, here's a generalized test, and I'm going to score something as a, you know, a one or a two, and like, what's that tell you? Well, it just tells you what the score is, right? Versus a different approach where you say, okay, every time we find that someone's got um, an increase in uh, the ankle eversion torque, which is basically looking at, um, at ankle instability, right, in the frontal plane, we see that correlate back to this test, and this test with a very high level of specificity, right? Every time we see someone with, um, with uh, lumbo pelvic or low back and pelvis coordination issues, we trace that back to this type of clinical test. So once you start getting all that data, we saw really, really, really high sensitivity and specificity, which means that we can measure things really well on a table and see how that correlates back to gait performance. And then the, the inverse is also true, right? Looking at someone's gait performance, quantifying things, if you find some imbalances, they're going to also have those things on a, uh, you know, exam test as well. So mm. we started to kind of put those patterns together and find out, okay, and it's just, people always say, well, wait, should you do the running gait analysis first and then do their musculoskeletal exam or do that first and then watch them run? And you can do either, right? I kind of think it's fun to do the musculoskeletal analysis first because, again, if, if I look at someone and say, okay, we've got a problem in, let's say, uh, rotational hip control and lumbar pelvic uh, coordination, right? So that's cool. And then people compensate differently for that, right? Some people mm. may kind of unload the affected side. Some people shift and load the affected side more. So then it becomes, in a, you know, it's almost like the fun game of, oh, okay, you got these problems. How have you compensated for the past, you know, five years from that, right? And then so how does that impact the global loading through your body? And then how does that impact what we do to fix you, right? Because mm. most people come and see me don't have a pain that came up last week. They're, they've had like, I've had, you know, right side of problems for the past 10 years of my life. And I've had 10 different injuries. And I'm like, okay, well, that's even further strengthens the point that you don't have a diagnosis we have to, tr- you know, chase. You have problems we have to fix. And, you know, yeah, one time you got a stress fracture in your tibia. Next time you got the carpal pain. Next time you got some, you know, uh, you know a, a, a hip stress fracture, right? That's not different stuff. It's the same thing, just kind of just shifting around your body. So that's where the fun part is for me is chasing those things. Do you find getting that message across to patients hard or challenging? Like trying to explain the, you know, their the stress fracture isn't the problem. Uh, it, it can be. I mean, I, I'll I'll be honest. Like the the weird thing in my career is that most people don't come and see me first, right? They basically have gone through a number of things. They failed traditional rehab, and so by the time they see me, they're frustrated. They're like, they're ready for an, a real answer, and they're ready to kind of put the mental energy to get there. So my clients and patients tend to be ones that are pretty receptive. Uh, but I, I would say yes, it's a change in framework for sure. I mean, you're you're trying to shift somebody away from what's my diagnosis written on my paper I took home versus you know how do I fix things right and and sometimes it's a conversation between us. Sometimes it's a conversation between us and their coach. Sometimes it's a conversation between us and their parents if they use sports right. So I really draw in resources because one thing you've got to have is you have to have buy-in from your patients. I mean, mm-hmm. I. I if you want to, if you want to criticize me for one thing in my career, and everyone should, is that I overeducate until I just can't talk anymore with every single patient because I really want them to understand what's going on. Because if they do, they're invested in really, you know, taking ownership and and you know, playing along to fix these things. And you know, we know that rehab isn't passive, right? It's not something I'm going to give you a pill or give you a sheet of paper and say go home. It's stuff you have to do. So. I really, really, really make a, a big point to make sure you know my patients and my athletes understand what's going on, so that they understand why it's important. A great time to fix these things, and that's how you get better is by having buy-in. Yeah, it's funny how hey, it's. I'm in a similar boat where majority of my patients now have been through, you know, every other practitioner in town, um, and it does make it easier, but. I'm definitely guilty as well of that over over educating because I, I 100% agree that you know I can't remember who said it, uh, but healthcare is self care. There was I think it was someone in our in our um, 
Healthy Foot Alliance group that had actually said that at some point. So I'm sorry if I've stolen someone's phrase, but um, but it's true, right? Like if you don't get that person on board and make them understand what it is they're trying to fix, then why should they buy into the process? <laughs> like they just want to get out of pain. That's human nature is get out of pain. And if your pain's in your ankle, that's what you're going to focus on. But if you can explain to them and make them understand that bigger picture, then 90% of them or more are going to want to invest that time, like you said, into doing the work at home and, and seeking out maybe other opinions to, to actually get that problem fixed, which is where the magic happens. Yep. Totally. So with, um, with running, this is probably a loaded question, <laughs> but a lot of people run for fitness, right? And most people I see in here that have started running for fitness end up in here because they then end up in pain. So when it comes to running, obviously fitness is a big part of it and being fit to run is a big part of it. But how important is skill or technique when it comes to running and gait? Very. <laughs> <laughs> Told you, a loaded uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> loaded question. I'm hoping you can get a message across to some of these people that, you know, I sometimes struggle to, to make them understand there's a difference between fitness and functional movement. You know, like you're running, you want to run well to run for a long time. How do you yeah. explain that to people to make them understand that this stuff is important? <laughs> right. So I would say this, like, you know, if you look at the, people always say, I got hurt because I did too much too fast too soon. And we've all seen people do that, right? You, you, you haven't run at all, right? The pandemic hit and you decide you're going to run a marathon, right? And so it's like, no, you don't run a marathon in six weeks, right? I know you can probably find some online training calendar online, but don't do that, right? So, you know, if you take the outliers out, right, if you kind of forget that, people don't get hurt because they do consistent gradual training and gradual increase in training loads. They get hurt because they bring poor conditioning, right? And not talking about heart and lungs, but poor conditioning of their neuromuscular control to the equation, right? So what happens is you've taken the fact that you have, you sit at a computer for 10 hours a day, right? And you're texting for another hour and a half a day. And then you're sitting on the sofa for the rest of the day. And you have really, no offense, but you have really poor body awareness and body control. And all you did was now add a certain volume of running on top of that. Well, mm. no wonder that, you know, high amounts of forces are going in the wrong location. And you know, your body doesn't have the skill to sort of figure that out. And so you can probably hit the nail on the head. Running is 100% a skill, right? And, and so, you know, it's basically just throwing rubber bands, throw, throwing energy around rubber bands or, or quote, mm. tendons, right? That's what we're doing when we run um, from a biomechanical perspective. But you have to have the awareness to use your stability, right, in terms of proper rotation of your upper body and lower body, proper core control, proper steering from your hips, steering from your foot and ankle, and force generation through your hips and knees and, and ankle, right? And like, that has to be there. Like, and, and so, you know, you get into a question of, well, yeah, you cheated things for a little while, right? Maybe you ran, you know, 25K a week, right? And you were okay. And then maybe you started bumped up and you went to, you know, 40K a week. And then you started to have some things that didn't feel so good. And you said, I'm going to keep training with my training group. And you up to 70K a week, right? And then, uh-oh, things hurt, right? And so damage occurs. And so, you know, you can get away and kind of your body's, you know, bodies are strong. I mean, you can get away sometimes with, with a little bit of an imbalance and kind of, you know, cheat the system a little. But over time, if you kind of keep at it or if you increase, you know, you throw some speed work, you throw in some, some increased mileage or whatever, those things become cumulative, right? And so um, if you don't lack the skills to fix those problems, then we see red flags, right? But I would say to spin this and make it a good news scenario, right? We can fix those problems, right? And, and you know, running is more than just pegging your heart rate. Running is about bringing those, you know, systems to, in, in terms of control and body awareness and stability to the table. And if you can do that and learn that, and we, and you can't. I and mean, again, I've got thousands of case uh, uh, you know, case areas to show how we can fix things. And so, uh, you know, again, not just from I think you can do better and I'm out of pain, but like seeing data change from pre to post, right? So mm. we know to improve these things with a specific you know point of attack. And so um, there's hope for everybody out there. <laughs> it's not even just running, is it? It's like movement in general comes down to what you're saying. Like because I see the same thing with people who go to the gym. You know, they might not be running. But it's the same scenario. They either haven't been for a long time or they've upped the weight that they're lifting. Um, might be a different sport, cycling, whatever. And 
the mechanics are a little bit off. Like you said, that that force is there, gets overloaded for whatever reason, and they'll blame that activity. Oh, you know, I've been going to the gym and the, damn, the gym, it's so bad for you. Oh no, your body's bad for you. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it, I, always, I always laugh. It's the analogy I use all the time, right? If you walk in, if, you're, if you've never lifted a weight before in your life, right, and you walk into a gym and you see some person over in the corner you're deadlifting 400 pounds, right, you probably know you shouldn't do that as the first thing you do that day, right? Like that's a little bit mm. above your head to start with, right? Um, I hope so. <laughs> There's a lot of people um, try it. <laughs> right. But if you look at running, you're like, oh, I can just put my shoes on and go, right? So running has this really low approachability to it, right? It's like a, a, a low point of entry, right? You think about, yep, I'm, I, I can do that, right? I can go. And you can, right? And you can, and, and you definitely should be able to do this, right? But Again, our lifestyle has created these imbalances such that we have to think about realistically where should we start, right? So, you know, should you be able to deadlift 400 pounds? 100%. I don't see why not, right? Um, but you're not going to do that day one, right? And then from the flip side, do we see people deadlifting the 400 pounds with excessive rounding their low back and blowing out their spine? 100%. We see that too, right? So you can do things correct, and your body's pretty robust at, at tolerating those loads if you do things correct. You can do things wrong and blow parts up quite easily, or you can, you know, do things, to, you know, not having foundational skill to try and enter in that new sport you're looking at. So it's not a running problem by any means. And I, I work with, you know, skiing snowboarders and uh, all the, you know, cyclist guys. And, you know, I can tell you the same patterns we see, uh, you know, it's like people get really good at doing one thing and they don't get good at the other things, but those details aren't details. They're actually really, really, really important. Yeah, it's almost like a disconnect happens over time, isn't it, between different parts of the body and then we focus on that one part rather than reconnecting the chain. It's almost like, I mean, we spend a lot of money on our cars, right? Most people are happy to take their car to get serviced every, you know, six months, whatever it is. Um, you know, you pay that money, you put that time in to leave it there and all they're doing is tuning things up and making sure there's still connections, you know, between the oil, this, that, whatever. I'm not a mechanic, I don't know, but... But then there's other people that will go and put fancy things on their car, new colors, and that's kind of like the fitness side of it, of trying to make things look bigger and faster. But you're still going to spend that money on tuning the car. But for some reason, with our bodies, we never do the tuning. We want to right. do the, the new paint job and look nice and healthy. And, but it's that tuning inside that we just, for some reason, we've never been taught to look after our own body and, and give it those little fine tunes every now and then just to keep things running smooth until it breaks and then we're like ah oh, we can't buy a new one damn what are we <laughs> now where's jay you nailed, it. <laughs> you nailed it you nailed it and like and to bring let's make offer one other point too so i've seen lots of you know uh, uh it's just use a running example because it's really clear um i've seen lots of runners who ran in elementary school ran in high school ran in college right and then they're post-collegiate and they're Olympic, you know, Olympic qualifier stage, Olympic caliber, whatever, right? And so then I've seen a number of athletes who played soccer, or, or your football or soccer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and played that as, in youth and played that in high school and played that in college. And after college, kind of, you know, if they're not playing post-collegiate, uh, post they decide to go into running, right? And so you've got people who are both at the same, quote, fitness level, right? Mm. But you've got these people who are pure runners, who what do runners do? They work in one plane. They run forward all mm. the time. And most of them don't put the time in, right, to work on these little details we're talking about. And they are, are very, I would say, for the most part, considerably more delicate, right, in terms of being able to tolerate stresses in their body than the soccer slash football folks, right? Because why? Football and soccer people are doing tons of multi-directional things all the time, right? They're running forward, backwards, sideways, drills, all the time, refining technique, right? Always. Mm. That's what you do in soccer. And so, yeah, they're fit because you run a bunch playing soccer too, right? But they come in and it's like, it's almost like you walk in and you're at a party you're like, like, wow, this food is horrible. This is what everybody wants, right? Like, it's that you know, profound. It's like, this is what you're striving for. You're striving to build the skills of body control to put in. And then those athletes are robust. They can just take mm. so much more, you know, training load without breaking down because they built this for, you know, 10, 15 years of building solid strategy and control. And that's what we should be focusing on, right? Um, one, one of the, the most prolific running coaches in the world, Joe, Joe Vigil, uh, said this in one of his talks years ago, and I loved it. He goes, you know, 
here's my reality. Who comes out for track and field? Well, the kids who didn't make soccer, basketball, football, and baseball, right? They want to play a sport, but they don't have the coordination. They're, quote, not good enough. So what do you do? Well, go try cross country and track, right? And I'll take anybody. But the people coming to me are the kids who don't have good coordination skill. And now I got to throw a bunch of volume at them. And so he's good enough and astute enough to realize, let's work backwards and help these kids out. But, mm. you know, most people in the sport of running, and again, I'm not being critical, but a lot of them, say the vast majority, don't have their requisite skill in terms of body control and awareness. And so we're really going to try and, you know, make these things apparent and say, look, like, is this going to take time away from your running volume? It might. And you know what? You're going to be all the better for it long term, right? So, you know, it shouldn't take five hours a week, right? But there's some things that you should be doing on an ongoing basis to really help you improve. Mm. And this applies to any sport, right? But just, it's, it, it really just, hearing that, like that clear cut was really interesting. I think, I hope it'll give some listeners some, some framework to say, look, like anybody can improve, right? But that improvement is not going to come from hitting more kilometers per week. It's just not, right? It's going to come from taking deliberate steps to fix the imbalances you've got. And if you do that, you're going to come out ahead of the game, period. Mm. I know with, because um, over here I do a lot of board sport stuff. It's a little mm-hmm. bit of snow, but it's more, more surfing. Ditto. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. So in that asymmetry sort of thing, I see the same with surfers. You know, like even yeah. though they're definitely multi-directional, really a lot of the time, it's still an asymmetry of rotating one way all the time, one stance. And a lot of the issues or on their left dominant side. 100%. So the work then comes into, which again, takes away from their time in the water training for technique. But yeah, trying to balance it back out and get rotating the other way again. And what do you see? Less injury, more power. Because like, they actually start to reconnect the whole chain again. You know, it's not all technique of how to you know, turn and the actual board technique. It comes down to, like you said, body awareness, proprioception, switching all these things back on. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, we have a standing river wave about uh, 400 yards from my house. And um, so it's interesting to me getting into this now because when you're in the ocean, right, you are you pick predominantly right, so predominantly left, depending on your stance. And it's, you're right, it's very asymmetric, right? Mm. And the river wave, you go back and forth. So at four, you, like, it really, you, you pick up on those imbalances in you know, front side and back side dynamics really acutely because you, you get just as many reps front side as back side, right? It's one to one. And it's been interesting even myself to realize, wow, I whip through differently on my toe side versus my heel side. It, it's, it's really interesting to get that many reps in. And it's, it's fun to sort of like tease the little imbalances out. It's like a little surf lab. Yeah, it is mad. I'm going to come over yeah. and visit. You should. <laughs> even with the snow, like we don't get as good a snow as you guys, but my son, we go to the snow a lot over winter here. And my eight-year-old son's quite good at snowboarding for his age. And he's ambidextrous. So for a long time, he couldn't pick a direction, which is kind of good. And one of his coaches had sort of made the point of saying, without knowing anything about biomechanics, but just knowing about what he sees with his athletes with injuries, he said, just make sure he does half the day one, one direction half the day and switch because he's, he'll be way less prone to injury if he can yep. ride both ways. And that's kind of what we try and do. Same as skating, we just make him ride both ways to, to nut out those imbalances without having to do an exercise. So it's just, it's just part of his training. And you just gave him such a leg up for the rest of his life. I mean, it's especially when we talk about kids, like little things like that, forcing the non-dominant side, you know, forcing the, the, less preferred angle right like that just always goes back to building skill that they'll you know it's almost like i tell people like if you're a good sport parent you should have your kids not now but in like 20 years write you a letter and go oh dad i realize why you maybe do all that stuff that was weird back then not hard just weird right just felt mm. strange i get it now right and you know because kids are out there for fun they, that's what they should be doing it's chasing fun but if you can kind of put those little things and sort of tease it in behind the scenes uh it pays off in spades you know, I understand why you made me bear crawl before every surf session. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I teased my whole childhood, but now I'm really good. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, do you see with like the, so you do a lot of snow stuff yourself? Yep. So with, what's your take on footbeds in snowboard boots? Do you use them? Do you? So, yeah, it's a good question. So, um, 
let's just say this. When we look at gait, running, walking, whatever, right, your foot has a very different purpose than it does when you're in a snowboard boot or a ski boot, right? Um, so when you're walking, running, your foot's an adaptive accommodative lever, and then we have to transmit force, okay? When you're looking at skiing, right, you don't ski with your feet. You ski with your foot and your shin, right? It's a rigid boot, okay? Um, so your foot doesn't have to move. So there are times I will accommodate some, if somebody's got a, someone's a zebra in a field of horses, right? So if they're, they're definitely an outlier, I will definitely look at changing things inside their boot for sure. Um, I rather fix people's problems, again, go back to what we are saying, versus just say, stick this in your shoe and go, because people aren't just snow athletes, they're also people, right? So mm. um, you know, what we do outside of that sport is also important. So um, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not one who jumps to stick things in boots. Um, when we look at snowboarding, the foot does have to move a little bit more. There's more torsion front to back and side to side. So there's different motions there. Again, I still try and get the foot and ankle to move better and, st and stabilize better. Um, other times I put things in, sometimes yes. I would say um, uh, maybe like 30% of the time for, for ski and snowboard folks, as opposed to you know a lot of folks who stick them in everybody's. Um, mm. So it, it's definitely less. Uh, but I'll contrast that to, you know, uh, ground-based running sport athletes not just runners any you know i'd say i i probably do i'd say maybe five to eight percent of people i work with ever get anything in their shoe in those type, type situations yeah. so yeah yeah it's funny it's hard to get research on well snowboarding in particular i find most of it's around putting insoles in you know like they're obviously funded by footbed companies totally <laughs> But for myself, when I started fixing my own feet, my own body, when I had orthotics in my snowboard boots and for years I had a knee injury, so I was constantly trying to find the perfect insole. And it wasn't until I started actually fixing my biomechanics and my body that they became really uncomfortable, right? I was in barefoot shoes by this point. So I thought, oh, I'm going to take them out and just see what happens. I'll probably be in pain, but this is a bit of an experiment on myself. And... I was so much better. <laughs> I found I had so much better connection to my board. I've gone um, like less rigid boots over the years mm -hmm. now because I, it's like I can feel my feet again. I can actually move and get that torsion you're talking about. I don't feel as just jammed. And no wonder my knees were so sore before. Totally. <laughs> just keeping them in this rigid position and trying to rotate around them. But yeah, it's hard to get research on that. So it's interesting to get your take on, on that. Yeah, I mean, you gotta, yeah, it's like, you know, most of the, most, again, I hate to generalize, but the vast majority of insoles and things people are sticking in ski and subword boots are about locking the foot in a rigid position. And again, skiing, you might be okay with that a little bit because, again, you're pivoting from the, the edge to edge, right? It's the different mm. type of dynamic. But and the boots are so stiff as well, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, it's like, I, I get that all the time. Like, your foot probably doesn't matter because you're in this 130 flex boot, which does it's like a rigid lever, right? You're skiing with your mm. foot and your shin together. It's a different system. But still, where you got that torsion and you, you know, the torsion doesn't occur just in your hips, right? If you pivot your hip, guess what? Your entire thigh and your, and your shin and your foot and ankle have to be able to roll in and out. And so, if, go back to saying, if you go with the ski mindset, which is let me kind of block things from happening, what happens is you're kind of putting people in a forced position, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're setting, if you may say, well, you go too far in, I'll put you way too far out. Well, that may work on a hillside turn, but not on a toe side turn, right? So you wind up with that forced transition problem. And it's like people wind up kind of teetering. You almost feel like you're falling on your edge versus kind of just, you know, rotating on your edges nice under control. So it's a, it, yeah, it's, again, I mean, you nailed it. If you can feel where you are, right, that's better. And so if you know, any clinicians who are listening, if you're going to put something in there on somebody's ski or summer boot, make sure you're not taking away that purpose of input because once they lose that position sense and feel, they're, it's like, why would you take sensory information away from somebody in their, in their sport, right? We want to help make sure they can feel things. So um, if you're going to do something you think it's valid, make it small. But again, I'd prefer us to be proactive and think about how can I fix the underlying problems? And maybe it's, you know, titrating out, right? Maybe it's, you know, they're seeing you in January in season with issues, right? You might want to put something in to calm down acute irritation, but your goal should be, how can I get them out of this in, you know, a, a few weeks to a few months, right? To, to really get them kind of a solid foundation on their own without depending on something else inside their boot. Yeah, 100%. That's always my goal. Like, regardless of whether I think I can get someone out of 
an authority for any sport, it's always, how do I get this person out of this? What do I need yep. to do to create function, right? So even with like the board sport athletes, do you find gait analysis and gait testing still really important? Uh, yeah, so there are tests. I mean, we do um, for for all athletes, right? This thing called um, force testing. So um, I, I do this with every athlete we work with. It's basically, you, it's a jump test and we measure the uh, force they put out on a double leg jump and mm -hmm. we look at the rate of force development, right? And we look at that on both sides. Um, and that's a very insightful uh, measure into gross body mechanics. We know in every sport out there, the people who apply force down on the ground quicker tend to be more explosive, more dynamic, more controlled, and more successful in the sport. And if you look at how can I improve someone's baseline capacity, right? We do that test, we actually can find out, okay, like based upon your cohort and your sport, et cetera, like where are you in this range, right? And you so you're coming in. And so everyone else in your sport in this position is testing here and you're way over here, right? We need to sort of bring that back to baseline. So it's a way for us to look at kind of the, the neuromuscular recruitment level and also at baseline force generation um, skill, right? It's a skill. It's not just can I squat 400 pounds slowly, it's how explosive are you? And it tells us very clearly you know do we have to work on strength do we have to work on power work where are you compared to your peers your cohort etc um it's a really nice insight to uh to help people out for sure yeah awesome do you use uh do you use pressure plates for that do you uh force plates yes force plates, so, yeah. yeah and there's a number and i'm going to correct you but there's pressure plates are different than force plates right so pressure plates that get sort of center pressure um and uh force plates that get um three axis uh uh, force generation. So it's very different in terms of what you can measure. Um, you can cheat a pressure plate uh, a lot easier than you can cheat a force plate on your jump testing. Um, so that's important. And then um, there's a number of systems out there these days that are great. Uh, you know, you know, again, even if you if you asked me even three or four years ago to do rate of force development testing required, I don't know, sixty to seventy thousand dollars worth of gear uh and these days you can if you're a clinician you get a system for you know under in the u.s for under two thousand dollars um that gives you a lot of directional insight in, uh, on these on these uh on these matters and again it takes you know two minutes to do this test it's not a a, a long uh test at all so it's something that you can incorporate in to, to really help prepare your athletes mm, okay that's awesome to know you're looking into a force plate <laughs> yeah um all right, let's talk about the MOBO board. So obviously that's a big part of um, the rehabilitation phase of getting some connection um, mixed in with other exercises and drills, obviously. And there's, you know, lots of other ideas in your books and online of different exercises people can do to start generating more um, improved biomechanics. But the MOBO, how did that come about and what, what can it do for us? Yeah, so um, again, MOBO is born from those same imbalances and problems we talked about before, right? I saw these things play out all the time where, you know, we had issues. And so if you have issues in, you know, rotational hip control, there's 9 million exercises to look at that, right? And then we've got, you know, lots of content and people, a community and Instagram idiots and all these kind of people who, you know, love to, mm. to push these drills. And you look at the foot and ankle and like the state of the art a few years ago in foot and ankle control was doing, you know, towel curl scrunches and marble pickups and, you know, doing some TheraBand sweeps. And it's like, how does that in any way prepare your foundation for the things that you need to do? And so then we have other people saying, oh, I'll put you on a soft squishy mat, right? Which lets you kind of roll the outside and kind of what I call the um, very, uh, very reactive instead of very proactive in terms of balance control. So, mm -hmm. What we what I looked at is, can I can I figure out a better environment to train the foot, right? So um, I want to get people to stop curling and gripping and using the muscles outside your foot, which are up in just call extrinsic muscles up in your shin, and get better at using muscles inside your foot um, to drive your big toe down for support, which drives your arch up, which gives foundation and stability for everything up the chain. And so I started playing around with some things and bought a little CNC machine in my garage and started, you know, uh, changing different cutouts and axis and so forth. And eventually wound up with the, with the design of the Mobo. And so Mobo is a, it, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a, it's a round uh, disc. And so there's a cutout for toes two through five and a solid platform for your big toe. And so the idea that it's intentional, it's not to say little toes are important, 
but it cues you out of using those extrinsic muscles up in your shin and kind of cues you or i.e. forces you to find and feel muscles inside your big toe and arch to get proper stability. That's number one. Number two, uh, it pivots. It pivots in a specific axis. It pivots in the axis of pronation and supination. And those aren't bad words. They're actually good words. Everyone pronates and supinates. Um, the problem is people can't stabilize that motion. That's where we run into trouble. So um, it pivots in that direction. And the third thing that's unique about it is it's closed chain, right? So instead of sitting there just sweeping a TheraBand back and forth, you actually train your foot in sync with everything else upstream. And a secret, you can't train rotational control of your foot and ankle without also training rotational control on your hip. So people always say, oh, my hip works a little bit too in this. And yeah, it's like a little built-in side benefit is we try to train things together. So um, it was built as a tool to help people get more bang for their buck out of time invested. And that's one thing. And then the second thing I would say is most of the time, even with the stuff I was doing with foot and ankle, um, again, details really matter with foot. Like imagine your hands, right? They're very, very perceptive and aware. There's lots of degrees of freedom and you can do lots of your hands and your feet are the same way, but most people just don't know how to control them. And so I, I teach people exercises and they'd, they'd go back at home, they'd come back and see me and say, hey, show me what you did last time. I'm like, no, that's wrong, right? So <laughs> the mobile is a way for me to say, hey, look, do me a favor, do this. And you, you kind of have to figure out how to do it right because it, if not, the board just becomes wildly unstable. And so it's just a, it was designed in my mind as a better environment to train foot and ankle uh, control. And um, so, yeah, that's it's we I launched it about two years ago and it's been uh, really well received as a, as a tool to again integrate in and kind of build on things that everyone's working together, right? We're all trying to mm. have our athletes become more robust and it's, it's a simple way to improve your athlete prep. Can you? backtrack a little and explain the importance of the big toe because like you said one of the main features and i'll put links in the bio um to the mobile board as well so you'll see what it looks like but like jay said there's a cutout under the you know second third fourth and fifth toe so it's just your big toes on a platform balancing on this board well not even balancing being yeah, taken through a direction on this board which really helps to engage the big toe. And I see clinically, most people don't stabilize their big toe. They don't use their big toe when walking anymore. So Jay, can you just explain the importance of the big toe to really nail in why people need this MOBO to, to reactivate that big toe? Yeah, and so um, be clear, I'm, I'm not a very good marketing person. I speak from science and function. So the stuff yeah, I tell you is, better. yeah, right. It's not MOBO, it's the reality, right? So um, I'm going to approach this from two perspectives. We'll talk about the neurological changes between your big toe and your little toes. And we'll talk about the mechanical changes uh, between your big toe and little toe. Let's talk about the neurological changes first. Um, you have areas in your brain, okay, it's called your homunculus, which is it, a fancy word saying parts of your brain uh, control different parts of your body. Real simple, right? Different parts of your brain control your fingers, different parts control your quads, different parts control your tongue, right? So, and you have certain areas in your brain that are dedicated to certain regions in your body. Um, you have a different region of your brain connected just to your big toe, not your little toes, right? So you're wired neurologically to have more control over your big toe versus little toes. That should say that's probably pretty important, okay? You think that's so. one thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's one piece of the equation. Now let's look at the biomechanical side, the mechanical side, or biomechanical side, whatever word you like. Um, if you look at your uh, your quad, right, your quadricep muscle in your thigh, you have a pulley, right? You have a, a patella or a kneecap, and that and that the job of that kneecap is to change the leverage of your quad, right? Quads are really important for letting us walk, right? Um, and so uh, kneecaps allow us to increase leverage to the front side of our leg to be able to walk. So that's really important, right? Well, guess what? You actually have two little bones, okay, or pulleys are called sesamoid bones, and they're at the base of your big toe, right? And so again, when you start to see the body have pulley systems in to increase force transfer of muscles, that should tell you something's pretty important. And you have those in the big toe and not the little toes, okay? And the reason why they're there is to increase leverage and force generation through that big toe so you can build a solid foundation to push off, to run, to cut, to jump, to do anything we do, right? So a lot of our foot and control really comes from building that neurological connection in our brain and that biomechanical control, right, around that structure to, again, drive that big toe down, which 
pushes the arch back up for a solid platform. Your entire body rests on top of your foot, right? Like everything does, right? So if that connection point is wobbly and unstable, you know, do you really think that $200 pair of shoes you bought is going to fix that problem? No, it's passive, right? That thing you bought that weighs, you know, a, a, what, a few hundred grams, right? It's not going to control your body. You have to show up proactive, right, to build that support yourself. And so that's the whole mechanism behind this is how do I take advantage of that neurological connection, right? We know that we don't train things in part. I don't just have you just train your foot. Hey, you train your foot with the rest of your body, right? So that gets the neurological connection built in. How do I control the, you know, the biomechanical aspect? Well, I'm going to teach you how to use it, right? Just in the way it moves. I'm going to stick y'all here and say, this is exactly how your body works. It needs to drive down. It tilts this direction. Let you figure that out. So that's the whole reason why it was built in that way. And again, I'm a big fan is of don't, you know, just put a bunch of marketing spook about, you know, whatever. It's a product. Like find out how the body works, work backwards from there, build something that makes sense, and then let the results that you have speak for themselves. Yeah, 100%. And like, there's obviously other ways to strengthen and connect the big toe. 100%. But, you know, and I'm not just saying this because Jay is here with me. I've had the MOBO um, in here for, uh, what's it been? I can't remember. Set a part of six months, um, maybe longer now. And for me, I find, like Jay said, it's something that's really hard to stuff up. You know, like I used to jump in my little gym next door, either for myself or with clients to reconnect my big toe or theirs and try and get things working with bands and things. And you can do it. Like it's still a great way of doing things. And sometimes I do for certain people, but it has been a great tool for even myself. You know, I'll go in there, even with the fins out sometimes. So you'll see on the MOBO, there's these fins underneath that help it rock. Um, Sometimes I'll have it in there on the ground just as the flat board, not even rocking. I'll be on the phone making calls or whatever, just standing on one foot, just with my big toe anchored on it, just balancing with not even the rocker. And even that I find re-engages and connects and just fires up um, that medial chain, that so big toe, the muscles through the arch. Um, like I'll find that is enough even to just get things switching back on. So it's definitely something to check out. Um, if you're looking for, I wouldn't say a simple way, it's still not, you just have to put effort in. No matter what you want to do to, to recreate function, there is time and investment needed to do that. But as far as just having an object in your living room that you can just go and stand on and play with to help, you know, get this function improving, it is an epic tool <laughs> for doing that. And fun, there's like lots of different things you can start adding in with weights, um, bands, closing your eyes, all sorts of things to, to challenge yourself to make that um, like a different experience. Yeah. And Paul, that building two things I wanted to just throw in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a big movement right now to say that, oh, you know, shoes are responsible for screwing things up over a long time. And if we just all walk barefoot, it'd be fine. And like, I mean, I would say this. Yes, there's some truth to that. And, and I've, personally been involved in studies looking at how footwear affects gait and how footwear affects strength in long term and short term and so I've, I've, I've been not just reading things i've actually done the research on this i would say that we could sum it up walking is great right running is great and all these things are great that we do but we still go to the gym and take time to work on improving the way we move right and so um Yes, you can get out of your, you know, high heel, uh, overly cushioned, wobbly shoes. You've been getting less shoe. That's important for sure. But again, you also make deliberate attempts, right, to fix the imbalances and fix the problems. And so whether you buy a MOBO or not, you should make targeted time for foot development part of your routine throughout your career, like period, right? So uh, this is not anything to say like, oh, you, you know, you only have to do this, that, like you need to do everything, right? Yes, you can go for a walk, but you know what? You also take time to work on improving your body uniquely. So um, just keep that, you know, a part of this. You, you, you know, you work on your shoulders, you work on your pecs, right? You work on your quads, like your feet deserve love too. Yeah, and that's a really important message because when I started on this journey, I was quite vocal about anti-shoe and, you know, get rid of shoes, like, and I still do to a certain extent, but Jay nailed it there where it's, yes, shoes, probably do cause a lot of problems and we might just finish off with that in a second about some of that studies you've been involved in. But the, the most important thing is fixing your body. You know, if you have any imbalance and you take away the support, 
You know, it's like if you live in a neck brace all your life, it's probably not ideal. But if you're next week and you just take that off, good luck. <laughs> like there's, you need to strengthen that to be able to support itself again or a back brace or whatever it is. Like normally, you know, you injure your wrist. You might have a brace for a period of time, but then you'll take that off and go through drills to strengthen your wrist and surrounding muscles and the chain before you go and start doing normal movement again. But the foot, for some reason, we, we're kind of missing that point. We want to take away all that support that's been there for decades for some people and expect them to walk normally under load and under speed. And then, you know, it's just not going to happen. You need to put time into correcting this stuff. And then if you choose to change shoes or not, that's up to you. But getting the foot functioning is, in my opinion, a really important thing to be doing regardless of your shoe choice. Yep, 100%. Nailed it. So with the... Um, the shoe studies we're doing with gait, just to wrap up, what did you find? What's, what are better shoes? Like what is a healthier type of shoe or what did you find shoes do with gait? Yeah. So that's a little question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, like, you may, you may blow my mind here. No. So I, I would just say, you know, I wrote something in, uh, in anatomy for runners years ago, which, which I still holds hundred percent true. Uh, if you are someone that says that everyone in the world needs to be in a barefoot minimal shoe hundred percent of the time, wear a sport, you're an idiot. And if you say that everyone <laughs> needs to be in a 24, 12, highly rocker, all the cushion shoe for all the time, you're also an idiot. Right? So, um, I mean, let, let's be clear. You have to look at where that person is in their, in their skill development, what their sport entails, whether they want to have multiple shoes, right, in their, in their sort of, I mean, which I, I would be a fan of for reasons we can talk about, but, um, you know, you have to look at it, the it depends question, right? So um, for the most part, when you put people, I break down footwear into sort of four categories, right? Four, not categories, but four things to look at in the, in the shoe. So one is you want to have ramp from toe to heel, right? So we know that overly cushioned uh, footwear, excuse me, uh, high heel elevated um, shoes uh change a number of things in gait everything from like quad function to posture alignment to uh timing of, of uh, foot ankle stabilization like a number of things right that we mm. could be a five podcast on its own right um but that ramp angle really changes a lot of, of things and 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 for the most part for the worse right so um most athletes should be in less um of, a, of an elevated heel than four foot does everybody have to be zero no, and there are times that I would actually argue it's not important to be 100% flat. But for the for walking, 100%, you should be in a in a zero drop shoe because again the loads aren't that high. You know, it's walking is not very springy, right? It's not it's not from your tendons, it's from your muscle, from your calf yeah. muscles predominantly, and it's good to get those tissues used to being in a little bit longer position. You're not going to hurt anything. It may feel different the first week, but you're going to adapt to that real quick. Um, so that's the case there. When we look at running sports. Sometimes, again, just because we're dependent on what the shoe companies give us, right? Um, sometimes it may be the case to increase the heel a few millimeters just to allow for a little bit more cushioning underfoot if you have someone who's predominantly a heel striker. But again, those are outlier cases that try and get people in less. Um, so the, the ramp angle is, is, is a, it's a loaded question because it's not just cushioning. There's lots of different types of cushioning, right? Mm. It kind of takes us to number two. Um, cushioning right so uh, the research shows pretty clearly that um, if you run in a zero cushioned uh, shoe there is more metabolic cost to walk and run in a zero cushion shoe now why because the muscles have to do work a little bit more to do something right to, to stabilize your body and i'd argue for most runners that's actually advantageous right because you're actually going to dedicate some specific muscle activity which muscle activity incre increases growth increases development increases control so it's good right but if you said hey we're going to do a track session today am i going to wear my zero drop zero cushion shoes well that's not the time where i personally grab my zero drop zero cushion shoes i grab something with a little bit of cushioning not a lot a little bit of cushioning has been shown to decrease energy expenditure, okay? And everybody listens to this podcast probably wants to run fast at some point, right? So um, there's benefit in that. If you look at going more cushioning, like the maximal craze we're seeing these days, the research shows that there's not only an, an, an improvement uh, in, 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 um, in uh, metabolic effort, there's actually a decrease, right? So they actually wind up more unstable. And those overly cushioned soft shoes actually cause you to land stiffer, which causes a number of uh, issues with uh, mostly overstriding, right? So mm. um, 
more cushioning can really shift things in the wrong direction, right? So it's, I call those your cushioning thing on a marshmallow. You're right. You want a you want a small marshmallow that's very firm, right? So firm amount, small amount of firm cushioning is actually quite advantageous in terms of effort. Um, most of my time throughout the week is spent in a zero drop, zero cushion shoe, and I walk around play with my kids. I'm teaching. I'm at work, right? That's what I'm in most of the time because I want my foot a little bit taxed. Okay. Um, so we talked about cushioning. We talked about um, uh, heel, uh, heel heights. Um, then you have to look at fit in of the shoe itself. Um, again, most people are in too narrow of a toe box, and we've seen a lot of effort uh, proclaimed about this over years to widen toe boxes. And there are a number of options out there these days doing this. And I, I mean, I can't overemphasize how important this is. Uh, I mean, you think about it when your foot lands, it splays out, right? And if you, you know, the definition of stability is width always equals more, right? <laughs> and so if you're in an overly constricted uh, footbed, and that foot can't split out, you're compromising your ability to, to perform, right? So I don't care if you come in with poor foot ankle control or great foot ankle control, too narrow of a last underfoot is gonna compromise the way you can perform and that's just not smart, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for running, we're seeing lots of things come out wider. Um, there are a few startups working on some new soccer cleats these days. Um, the argument for, sorry, football, sorry for Australia, um, the, the argument's always been to, um, you know, that we need a narrower shoe to increase ball contact. And the reality is that's BS, right? So um, it is possible to have really good fit in a wider footbed and still maintain ball accuracy uh, or, or foot placement for ball accuracy on kicks, uh, but it's requiring the shoe companies to rethink their cleat design, right? Not a super rigid locked uh, interface, but something that has more torsion because we need things to move with the foot, mm. which takes me to my fourth point. Um, years and years ago, a company came to me and said, "Will you test this new version? Like, what's different? The flex grooves." And I'm like, "Great, you made new graphics in the bottom of your under your tread sole. Who cares, right?" And that was an uh, that project was an eye opening experience for me. Um, when the foot bed itself is very, um, let's say, united or cohesive, it doesn't torsion very well, right? And your foot is constantly torsioning, right? It's not just pronation, supination, just through the subtalar joint, your entire foot, right? The cuneiform bones, the, uh, the sesamoids, the, the, the metatarsals, they all need to kind of twist each other. And when you give the foot constant feedback, right? So when the, when the shoe moves with your foot, we have uniform sensory information go up to our brain to tell us where we are, what we're doing, so we can make better decisions, right? That's real simple. When you have an overly stiff amount of cushioning underfoot, it doesn't move with your foot. And we've seen that if the, if the shoe is not torsionally mobile, and when I say this, I mean like very torsionally mobile. Like you should be able to take a, a shoe and like just kind of shake it and it should sort of twist in itself. Um, those shoes pivot with the foot better and that really improves the way that we can adapt to the ground and that improves the performance that we then put down on the ground to run, cut, push off and jump. So um, I would say there's four things really important. Look at it for the most part, a lower, a lower um, heel to toe drop. Um, most of you, if you're in traditional footwear, have been in too high of a drop, that can come down. Um, number one, number two, less cushioning, right? So some cushion is beneficial uh, for sure. Um, for sport, right? For daily life, try and get as little as you can get away with. Um, then the shape of the shoe, make sure you have a toe box that's wide enough for you. And then number four is make sure that shoe, that shoe is very torsionally mobile. Um, and, and that's what I spend all of my life in too, right? This isn't like things I'm saying, everyone should do this and I do something different. Like that's exactly what I do. Yeah, that's perfect. And with the, um, the fit in particular, going back to the MOBO and the big toe stuff, as soon as you pull those big toes out of alignment, you're changing that um, kind of pulley system you were talking about. Like the pulley's now off on a weird angle, the joint's not centrated anymore. That in itself is gonna change that whole big toe experience, make it less stable, and make you need to be on the MOBO twice as much. So, yep. <laughs> wider fit shoe, half time on the MOBO, it's a win for everyone. Everybody's happy and you're happy. <laughs> That's right. I don't have to see them as much. Like, it's great. Isn't that the goal? Totally. Yeah. I tell people, like, I don't want you to come see me. I want to share with you, give you a plan and go home and work on it. Right. I don't want you to continue customer. So, <laughs> yeah. I had someone the other day say that. I they gave him this plan. I said, look, I want you to go and do this for two weeks. You know? Yeah. Oh, the last bit I just saw me um, every second day for six months. I said, what? And you're still here. 
I said, no, right. I, I, can't, I can't do this for you. You right. need to do this. And I said, I'm happy to, you want to come and sit here and I'll watch you do it. But you need to do this. Like at some point, you just have to do it. <laughs> there is no magic pill, but there is a smart plan. Right? That's right. That's right. Mate, thank you so much for your time today. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the MOBO, like I, I've been really excited to get Jay on to talk about this because yeah, I've, I have been using this myself. I'm really um, in love with this product as far as like, there's nothing really out there. There, there is nothing else out there like it. You know, we've seen balance boards before. When it first came onto my radar, someone had showed me, um, this is well before I knew Jay. Um, I thought, oh, it's not a balance board. I'm like, you know, cool. Like, I'll, I'll get around to it one day. And I did. And then I was really thanking myself that I didn't get around to it earlier because it's not a normal balance board. Like Jay said, this is a tool for retraining gait. Um, and what I see clinically with the B toe or lack of B toe use in a lot of people, this product is perfect for um, helping with that. So, Check it out. It's definitely one that is not your usual balance board. So, yeah, have a look at it. Um, and, yeah, Jay, thank you so much for inventing that product. Um, it's been a great asset to, to me at work here. And thanks for all the work that you're doing, all the research and, and the message you're spreading. It's really important. And, I, yeah, I love seeing the stuff you're coming out with. Awesome, Paul. Thanks so much for having me. It was a great chat.